In this lecture, I'm going to discuss innovation modes based on open networks. By an open network, I mean a network characterized by two features. First, access is not restricted by legal considerations, say contracts or hierarchy. Access is basically free to, um, to anyone. And second, uh, the work done is offered voluntarily and individuals choose the network they want to participate to. Um, let me start from the uh, what we did in the final uh, lecture, that is uh, open innovation. Um, we defined open innovation an innovation mode which tries to uh, discover, retain and exploit knowledge using internal and external channels, uh, which also means that open innovation is based on the use of internal and external resources, and external resources are resources that are not controlled by means of contracts or by means of hierarchy by the central organization. The central organization is the one organizing or having a core uh, role in the new product development project. Okay. Let me introduce a complementary way to look at open innovation. It is still based on knowledge, but in this case we refer not so much to the openness of the boundary of the organization as in the previous definition, the definition given by Harry Chesbra in the article I asked you to read. Um, in that case, open innovation refers essentially to the openness of the boundaries of the organization. In this case, I refer to uh, open openness in terms of the openness of knowledge. So innovation will be closed if the knowledge is protected. Innovation will be open if the knowledge is freely available to everyone. Or as the economists say, innovation is a public good. The two ways of defining open and closed innovation are not contradictory. They are both based on knowledge and they are basically complementary. Okay? So the first is about openness of the boundaries of the organization. The second one is openness of the knowledge underlying the innovation capabilities. Okay? I'm going to refer mostly to the, this idea of openness of knowledge knowledge is a public good in order to distinguish between closed and open innovation. On the basis of this, uh, an MIT professor called Eric von Hippel um, has introduced the idea that there are basically three fundamental modes of developing innovations based on the actor or the actors of the innovation initiative. The first one is the producer innovator, the second the single user innovator, and the third is the open collaborative innovators. I'm going to go very quickly through uh, the idea of producer innovator. I'm going to concentrate mostly on single and open collaborative innovators. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, the idea of producer innovator. Now, a producer innovator, as a rule, is an agent. It can be both an individual and an or an organization which, according to Schumpeter, initiates economic change in order to profit from selling a good, a product or a service. Okay? So the producer innovator is an innovator that develops products and services in order to sell them, in order to, to profit from the act of transacting goods and services in exchange of financial rewards. Okay? Um, a producer innovator is what the literature in management and economics has concentrated on in the past century. This is what it is the 
the uh, flesh and bones of management, it is the flesh and bones of economics, and it underlies the idea that economic activity or innovation is performed in order to gain a financial reward. This is definitely true, uh, this is definitely uh, a dominant mode, but what von Hippel indicates, for von Hippel has discovered, is that it is not the only mode. And there are other modes of innovations, other types of actors behind innovation uh, initiatives. So the, the producer innovator is uh, dominant, is what, as I said, has dominated the, the literature in management and economics. But in the, in, in the following, I'm going to concentrate on the other two forms of innovation. So, things are innovators. Okay, von Hippel um, started asking a simple question. The simple question is, where the initial idea regarding uh, the, 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 the innovative product or services come from? Did it come from the manufacturers, the people that profit from selling an idea, or did it come from users, the people who profit from using a product or a service? On the basis of this distinction between user and manufacturer, von Hippel discovered that in many fields, the majority, or anyway, a large percentage of ideas leading to innovations were developed by users not by manufacturers. If you see uh, in the slide, you have in certain fields like scientific instrument, the large majority of innovations were developed by users, either in semiconductors. An interesting case is the case of sports, of sport equipment, whereby, again, the majority of innovations are developed or were developed by users. We are going to see some examples of those. What this table tells us is that the traditional idea that innovation comes from companies that develop new products and new services because they want to profit from selling them is false. In many sectors, the opposite is true. Innovations come from users, and in the majority of the cases, users are not intended, or at least not at the beginning of the uh, innovation uh, project, that they don't intend selling the uh, product or service. So this is a very important finding in the history of economics and the history of management as it's generated a new approach about innovation and about the organizational forms underlying innovation. Let me give you a definition about this. And this, the, these slides come from von Hippel and it says the basic distinction is between, as I said, a user and a manufacturer. I repeat what I already said, a user innovation is classified as, a, as such when the developer expects to benefit by using the product or the service that is being developed. An innovation is classified as a manufacturer innovation if the developer expects to benefit by selling it. Clearly, the producer innovator is a manufacturer, uh, so the distinction we gave at the beginning between the three forms, clearly the, the, the producer innovator is corresponds overlaps with manufacturer innovation. What von Hippel has done is to develop then a, a, a so-called manufacturer center or user-centered view. In a manufacturer or producer-centered view, manufacturers are the developers of new products and they protect their innovations as intellectual property. You can immediately now match the manufacturer center view with a closed innovation model. Okay? In the, instead, in the user center view, this, uh, the things are different because many products, and we saw in certain fields, the majority of products are developed by users. 
so they are not developed with the with the intent of selling them okay the, the, the motivations behind development are different. Interestingly, users do not protect their knowledge, or at least in the majority of the cases, they do, do not do so. They, in the majority of the cases, freely reveal their innovation, freely share the knowledge they have used and the techniques they have used to develop a product or a service. This goes completely against the assumptions of traditional management and economics. If this is true, as it is, it immediately implies that companies can profit from users' innovations. If they find a way to d discover who the users are, where the users are, what they have developed, collaborate with them, user developed innovations can become a major feedstock, a major channel for product development organized by companies. What I'm saying here, or what von Hippel is saying, is that a new form of development whereby an alliance between users and companies is developed can become a major form of product development. And now, if you have read the article uh, about Procter & Gamble, you can immediately, you should immediately make the connection between the communities that Procter & Gamble has organized around the focal entity, PNG, and and the lead user or the user-centered view. What PNG has really done is to take this idea of user-centered innovation and develop an organizational form, connect and develop, in order to establish an extended network, which at the core uh, has Procter & Gamble, and at the periphery of this network has communities of users. Um, then, of course, user innovation is a good thing because all society profits from it in terms of better products and more products. And finally, the more we create um, technologies that enable users and organizations to interact, to discover, store and exploit knowledge, the more we will see the impact of user innovation becoming more and more important. And the fact that user innovation is important is proven by uh, a work that von Hippel has done, which I'm going to illustrate in a moment. Um, the article cited here from the New York Times is a very interesting article which I invite you to read. I also invite you to actually download the book shown on the right hand side called Democratizing Innovation. Uh, the book is an open source book so you can legally download it and invite you to read the first chapter which introduces the theory of uh, user innovation. This is very important and if you like the idea, if you find it useful, you can expand and read the other chapters. But let me go back to the ideas presented in this article and specifically to a work done by von Hippel. Um, von Hippel studied the user innovation, in this case in Britain, and they did a questionnaire and they discovered that among the British population, a large number, about 3 million people, corresponding to about 6% of the UK population, actually modify products and services. Modification for personal needs leads to uh, an expenditure in innovation which is actually larger than what all companies in the UK spend on innovation. What I'm saying is that the sum of what individual users uh, spend on their own petty projects on modification of existing products is actually larger than the aggregate expenditure of uh, enterprises. 
So users, uh, on average, spend more than manufacturers. And what do they develop? And what are the characteristics of the innovation um, development? They are reported uh, in the bottom part of the, of the, the slide. You see most of the many uh, users freely share the details of what they develop with other uh, other um, organizations or individuals. Um, only a tiny minority applies intellectual property rights to uh, to uh, their innovations, uh, and only a minority of them actually develop looks for comp financial compensation. Now, of course, not all the, uh, the the ideas developed by these people are worth of market introduction. Many of them modify or develop products for their own consumption and not for market introduction. In any case, it's stunning. The, the numbers reported here are stunning and reveal that innovation is a much more complex um, the picture innovation is much more complex than it was expected by focusing only on manufacturers. Just to give you an example of what they develop, users typically develop, here you have some uh, innovations. So you can see, for instance, could be vehicle related. Somebody develops an alternative type of static motors because of cold weather, or somebody develops uh, you know, something to ease the life of, in this case, of a, of a pet, a dog, um, medical problems, um, gardening, anything. What users do is to apply competencies they have, we call them hobby, or we call them knowledge developed because of hobbies, in order to make their life easier about the things they care. You know, users could be doctors looking to perform a new type of surgery. Uh, if, a, if a surgeon wants to develop a new type of surgery, the uh, specific instruments, be they software, electronics, or mechanical instruments, may not exist for the simple fact that the new type of surgery has never been performed before. Uh, manufacturers may not have an incentive to develop it because there's no market for it. And so what happens are uh, users, in this case surgeons, with specific expertises in the related uh, in the disciplines needed for the particular uh, surgery, as I said, be they software, electronic or mechanical, basically go on and develop their own instruments, their own tools. If the new uh, surgery is successful, then a market opens for the tools the user has developed. As the user, uh, many of these users are not interested in starting a company or commercializing their product because it's not a job, and they very often freely reveal or give away the innovation to the manufacturers. The manufacturers then enters the arena, but they enter the arena after the innovation has been developed. Okay, having said this, let me move to the second mode of innovation, which is open collaborative innovators. Open collaborative innovators is simply the idea that users very often get together and they form communities. So they form a relatively cohesive network in which knowledge is freely shared, competition and collaboration among the individuals forming the community become the main drivers of the development project and the sum of the imitation and the micro-improvements coming from the individuals form an entity which becomes the final innovation. 
So this is an effective form to innovate because it's based on collective knowledge and based on knowledge which is stored in the network of the community. It's a, it's a, it's a form whereby any innovation is readily uh, evaluated by the community, is imitated and improved upon. The results of the improvements are shared in the community and they lead to further improvement. It becomes really a positive feedback mechanism whereby good ideas spread immediately, good ideas are adapted to other local contexts, they are improved and the results are shared back in the community which leads to further improvement until uh, uh, an effective product or service has been developed. Let me give you some example of this and I'll give example uh, in the um, sport. Uh, and the example is the emergence of the mountain bike. Okay, I invite you now to stop and to watch this um, documentary. It's a five minute documentary about the emergence of mountain bike in uh, Marine County in California in the 70s. I invite you to pay attention to a number of, 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 of um, details, including the motivation that led uh, those people to interact in a community, the type of knowledge sharing, um, the, um, the type of network they formed, and finally, the, the passage, the evolution from a user development mode to a manufacturer development mode. Here in this slide I report the experience of a typical lead user. In this case, uh, this particular individual was interested in driving bicycles, especially on snow. Bicycles for that purpose did not exist, so what he did was to modify whatever was um, whatever technology or whatever type of bicycle he could find that could remotely perform the activity he was interested on in. So what, what, what this says is that lead users are users that have an extreme need. They do not find the means of satisfaction for that need in the market, but they don't start from scratch. They don't start from zero. They don't start from a basic drawing. They start from modifying existing objects developed for different purposes. Okay? Basically, road bikes. Uh, the development of road bike, the, the development from road bikes involves a form of mixing components coming from the bicycle industry or other industries in order to achieve the specific purpose. Uh, these type of users are called lead users because they tend to anticipate market trends. And in fact, these individuals anticipated the, the, the dimensions of the mountain bike. When the lead users, as I said, they get together, they form community, communities speed up because of network effects, the, uh, the process development the project uh, development. And when a uh, sufficient uh, advanced prototype has been developed and a sufficient number of individuals have joined the community, then what you have is that manufacturers enter the, uh, the fray, either because some users evolve into manufacturer or because traditional manufacturers discover that they can start or they can invade a new niche. Okay. Another interesting example of, of, of community now moving from the, the 70s, from prehistory of uh, development, community-based development to the, the modern history is Linux. The, I suppose you all know what Linux is. Linux is an operating system. It's now probably the dominant operating system in any, um, any computing which is not uh, desktop based basically from 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 smartphones to servers to to the internet linux is the dominating uh, operating system linux is, is not a traditional organization has not been developed by a manufacturer but on the contrary it has been developed by a community of uh, hackers 
uh, by the term hacker, I simply indicate people that hack, borrow other people's work, they do that legally, uh, they modify and they give it back to the community. So Linux has been developed by a community of volunteers, Co volunteers that share their knowledge for free without protecting it. The sum of the contribution of the individual hackers form a unity which is more complex than the sum of the contributions of, 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 the, of the developers. Let me explain it. Imagine that in a community what happens is that I contribute uh, a, certain, um, a certain amount of time and work, but what I get back is the, the full product. Okay? So the, the value I get back from my contribution is vastly larger than my contribution. And this is the basic incentive that drives the development of communities. Oh, it's at the base of community development. It's called a bazaar. It's called a bazaar because it's not organized by a hierarchy. There's no hierarchy. There's no selection of expertise. There's no uh, allocation of time, resource, or quality uh, uh, targets. There's no traditional management. Volunteers decide when they want to work, how much they want to work, and what they want to work on. And they contribute back the um, contributions to the, um, in this case, to an individual, to the project owner, in this case was a Finnish student called Linus Torvalds, the only power that Linus Torvalds has is to accept or not the contribution and then from time to time do a release of the latest state, in this case of the Linux software. Okay, So this is how a bazaar or an open source project works. It's called open source because the software is open to anyone to modify. From an economic point of view, Linux is free. You can download Linux for a cost equal to zero. So Linux is part of that new type of business model called freemium, whereby you may give away your product and you or other organizations may profit from related activities to, in this case, Linux. Uh, how does Linux work? There's a network of developers. As I said, they're volunteers. Uh, developers um, contribute some solutions to, say, a bug or new functionalities to the project owner. The project owner decides whether to accept it or not. This is done all in a transparent way. Every decision is posted on the bulletin board for the community to comment upon. When a sufficient number of, of, of changes has been done, the next release is out in the community and it uh, goes through peer review and feedback from the community which leads to further improvement and so on. You can see here how the positive feedback that we described or we call them the externalities, the, networks, the network effects we described in the previous in a previous lecture operates. Okay? Um, this is a sentence from Eric Raymond. Eric Raymond became well, uh, the, the manifesto writer of the community. It basically says, we're not dealing here with traditional organization. We're dealing with a network which is a self-organizing ecology, self-organizing because nobody decides who is going to do what, the time and the constraints that uh, uh, are set for each task. The community self-organizes it. It becomes an evolutionary organism going the direction of development results from the self-organization, the multiple conversations going on in the community. The, the single agents may be selfish, meaning they may, may be interested in their own reward, whether the reward is reputation or whether the reward is financial reward, to a certain extent it doesn't matter. They are autonomous agents maximizing their own utility, but the web 
of conversation, the web of interactions, form an ecosystem which generates a more complex value, a more complex order than traditional hierarchical based organization could ever achieve. Uh, as I said, these are based on different types of business models. Um, if you want to learn about this, a book by Chris Anderson uh, illustrates the business model called freemium. This is based on the idea that uh, users may not be so much interested in product market revenues. You know, what we said, this is what m motivates manufacturers. But if you develop a product in an open source way and you give it away for free, you can profit from other activities related to the product. So you may give away the product market revenue for free, but you may profit from support, from services, from training, from licensing, and so on and so forth. There are multiple uh, business models related to freemium. It could be the, the traditional Gillette approach, which is give away the racer and sell the blades. Or it could be the Wikipedia model in which everything is completely free, or it could be others. In software now, you know perfectly well that you have the so-called Skype model in which the basic functionality is free, but the more sophisticated functionalities may come for a price. It's a very interesting model and it is perfect for uh, open innovation. It is what actually open innovation uh, thrives on. Uh, uh, open innovation in software is big business. Here report the market share in um, open um, operating systems for the servers. The service is technology that runs the internet. Although this data are relatively old, you can see that Windows uh, for servers is very much behind the market leader, which is an open source project similar to Linux called Apache. Uh, the World Wide Web was developed by the community by a user. Tim Berners-Lee was an engineer at the high energy physics particle in Geneva, and he basically developed the World Wide Web because of his own curiosity. And then the World Wide Web was spread and was adopted by a community and became a dominant, well, the dominant technology that we all know. Uh, to summarize, uh, uh, to summarize the um, user community innovation model from an economic point of view, the community solves an important economic problem related to innovation. If a product doesn't exist, by definition, the market associated to that product doesn't exist. If, um, if, the product, if the market associated to an innovative product doesn't exist yet, manufacturers may not have any incentive to develop a new product. Why? Because there's no market associated to it. So you fall in a, into a chicken and egg uh, situation. Manufacturers may not have an incentive to develop a product because there's no market, but if nobody develops the market, manufacturers may never, may, may never have the incentive to develop the product, okay? No product, no market, no market, no product. What users do is to break that um, stumbling block. Why? Because, because they don't develop products in order to sell them, they develop products in order to use them. But by forming communities, they may form, as in this slide, the initial embryonic market which may then incentivize manufacturers to join the arena of, of product development to start from what users have already achieved and then to optimize it and develop maintenance, supply chain, uh, in, and apply their engineering skills, distribution skills, and marketing skills to the new product. So what the users do is basically, very often in many fields, develop the embryonic market that then convince manufacturers to uh, adopt the users develop products and to engineer them.